In this video, we're going to see a new circuit element called a inductor, inductor, uh, which looks like this. It looks like a coil. Um, and this circuit element called an inductor is going to have a certain value of inductance. And so your book starts this section by defining what this inductance is. Uh, this is the definition right here. It's the ratio of uh, the flux, the, the magnetic flux, so use the subscript M, but I'll, I might sometimes use the subscript B for magnetic field uh, flux. They're interchangeable. Though. It's the magnetic flux divided by the current. Uh, so if you have some current that's going through this device, you know, it's how much uh, magnetic field is maybe going through this. Uh, it depends on exactly how the coils are wound for which direction the magnetic field is going, but uh, the magnitude of that flux divided by the, the current gives you the inductance, which is by definition a positive uh, quantity. Um, so there's some B value and some uh, overall flux that's going through all of it. So a coil is the symbol for this thing because if you have the same current going through, say, a single loop of wire versus 100 loops of wire, you're going to get 100 times bigger flux for the 100 loops for the same value of current. So that would be a much bigger inductance. So inductance is this property that we notice a lot in for coils of wire, right? So everything, even just a single loop of wire would have some value of inductance, but we notice it a lot more for, for coils. So uh, a solenoid is a, is a thing we're really interested in for this. And your book very quickly calculates what the inductance of a solenoid is. Uh, so this blue circle is the general definition for inductance. Uh, and the red circle on the bottom there is the uh, the value for a solenoid of n capital N total turns, cross sectional area A, and length L is on the denominator there. Uh, it, it's a little tricky to see. This this right here is current, uh, but this right here is the length of the solenoid. Um, so you'll note so there's actually a slight difference there between some of that I and L. So this is after they they plug in everything that you get the the length of the solenoid on the bottom there. Um, okay, so um, we want to see why uh, inductors are important in circuits. Um, so really what this boils down to is Faraday's law. So start with the definition of inductance and move, and you can rearrange it like this, right? If L is the ratio of the flux divided by the current, uh, you can just multiply both sides by I and get this, this thing on the bottom right here. Um, so if you take this and you take the derivative of with respect to T of both sides of this, uh, you get um, this equation right here. So derivative with respect to T. So you'll notice that the left-hand side, if you're taking the derivative of the flux, the magnetic flux with respect to T, then from Faraday's law, that's an induced EMF across the inductor. So the induced EMF you can relate to this value of the inductance, which is a constant. Uh, an inductor has, a, it has an inductance that's independent of the current. You might say, well, what about, this, uh, what about this formula right here? It doesn't look like it's independent of the current. But the flux, the magnetic flux on the numerator is proportional to I. So if the flux is proportional to I, then that will always cancel. And so L is actually independent of I. So L is some constant, depending on the actual inductor. And how quickly the current is changing, you're trying to change the current through this, th through this device, there's going to be some what's called back EMF. So there's some resistance to it changing. It's going to try and resist the change. So if you're increasing the current, it's going to try and generate current in the opposite direction. If you're trying to decrease the, the, the value of the current, it's going to try and boost help along that current. So it's going to act like a battery that reinforces current in the same direction, or it opposes the current direction if it's getting stronger and stronger. Um, so here's an example of this. So uh, this is an example where di dt is positive. So di dt uh, is positive here. So the current's labeled as downwards, and it's getting stronger and stronger. So the coil doesn't like the fact that it's getting stronger and stronger. It, it just wants it to remain the same value all, at all times. So it doesn't like the fact that it's getting stronger and stronger. So it's going to try and act like a battery that, that tries to have current go the opposite direction. So that's why you have like a plus sign here and the minus sign here. So this is going to act like a little battery. And it's temporary because it's only, it only acts like a battery as the current is changing right there. 
but it acts like a battery where uh, this is the polarity. Right? It's going to act, it's going to try and generate current the opposite direction to slow down that increase. Um, so this minus sign, uh, so, so the, if you remember when we talked about circuits, you know, as you cross a resistor, say, in the direction of the current, you would have a voltage drop, right? Delta V would be negative. Um, as you cross an inductor, the delta V can be either be positive or negative. So you got to be a little bit careful. So this formula right here, circled, assumes that you're crossing it in the direction of the current. Okay, so this, this part is uh, emphasized right here, measured along the direction of the current. So notice how here, like if this was our initial point, this is our final point. I label it like that because that's the same direction as the current, right? Initial to final. So if you're going along, if you're crossing that circuit element in the direction of the current, this is the voltage gain or drop. So in our example in blue on the right, di dt was positive, right? The, the current was getting stronger and stronger. So di dt is positive, L is capital L, the inductance is always positive. And with this extra minus sign in the formula, it looks like the delta V overall is negative. And that's what we saw right here, right? This was the plus and the minus, right? We jumped from the plus side to the, mi to the minus side. It was a voltage drop. So as we go along the current, it was a voltage drop because the current was increasing. Um, and again, this goes back to, well, the, the inductor is trying to generate current in the opposite direction because it, it doesn't like the fact that it's increasing. Notice how if the current is decreasing, then the EMF, uh, then, then the back EMF, the inductor is going to try and generate current in the same direction as the current is going because it's trying to restore the, the decreasing in strength uh, current. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So you can get some practice with the uh, directions right here. We'll have plenty, plenty of practice in class too. An inductor is sort of the magnetic birth or a solenoid um, generalized to an inductor is the magnetic analog of what a capacitor is to electric fields. So you'll see this uh, analogy right here. Uh, a capacitor stores energy and really the energy you could say is in the electric field. So there's a formula for the energy stored in a capacitor, one half CV squared. Or you could consider it as, well, there's an energy density in the electric field. Uh, and so you could integrate this over the volume to also talk about the energy. So there are similar statements for inductors. There's energy stored in the inductor. And instead of one half CV squared, it's one half LI squared. So depending on how much current is going through your inductor, you're storing energy in there. Um, it's sort of interesting because you know we had we had current in wires before and we never said there was energy in the wire but there are there is energy in the wires normally we could ignore it but for a, a coil you can't ignore it if you have a big value of this inductance capital l you can't in, ignore that energy stored uh so there's energy stored in an inductor and really that energy is in the magnetic field so you can also talk about the magnetic field's energy density or energy per unit volume stored in the magnetic field and so if you actually took a solenoid and you took this value right here and you, which is constant inside an ideal solenoid, right? The magnetic field is constant inside one. If you took this value and you multiplied it by the volume of a solenoid, you should get the same value as this right here. You should get the uh, one half Li squared. Um, all right. So the next two sections are going over two particular cases. Actually, the rest of the class is studying how inductors behave in circuits. So the next two sections in chapter 30 just talk about, um, so first, no battery. So like you'll notice that in these pictures, there's no battery at all. It's just a single capacitor and a single inductor. And then the next section just has a DC battery, um, direct current battery. So in other words, just the EMF sources that we've seen before, um, where it's always trying to generate current in a single direction. The last chapter that we'll do, so chapter 32, talks about AC circuits. And we're going to spend several days talking about that and how inductors and other circuit elements behave when the source is alternating in the direction. Uh, OK, so the, finishing up this chapter, the, uh, we, want to, we want to get a feeling for how inductors behave in circuits. Um, and uh, here's one special case that gives us a feeling for how these two things store energy. 
um, how the capacitor stores energy versus how the inductor stores energy. Um, so, so really there's some resistance in the wires, but we're going to assume that it's negligible. So not much energy is being dissipated as the energy bounces back and forth between these two circuit elements. Um, so there's a there's a really some resistance here, but we're going to ignore it. We're going to say it's, it's very, very small, so very little energy. So the energy dissipation is slow. What happens here, and there's four pictures, uh, and they have you read it, you know, going this way and then down. So what happens is that if you start off with uh, energy stored in the capacitor, so you charge up the capacitor, and then you say close a switch, right, at t equals zero. So what happens is there's no initial current in the circuit, but the plus charges want to go around and go to this side of the capacitor. Right? As soon as you close the switch, then there's a conducting path to get to the other side. So the current would want to go in that direction. Um, the only problem is that the inductor prevents this from happening instantly. Um, so what happens is that as soon as you close the switch, the inductor limits how quickly the current can go up, uh, can, can, can go through the circuit. Um, so the, the current uh, starts going, going through. Uh, but it, and it builds up over time. Uh, and at a certain point, actually, this thing has totally discharged. So there's no more charges left on the top or the bottom of this capacitor. But there is current. So notice how the it says max I. The maximum amount of current is going on in the circuit. So here there's zero current. And here there's the maximal amount of current, I max. And if there's the maximum amount of current, there's the maximum amount, like, um, magnitude of the magnetic field that's through the solenoid, if that's the inductor. So there's all the energies in the magnetic field, whereas it used to be all in the electric field that was in the plates of this capacitor. But then what happens, so you'll notice that things don't just stop right here. So what happens is that the current keeps going because the inductor can't immediately switch off. So, so the, the current keeps going and actually it kind of goes too far. Like it, it goes so much that now the opposite side is building up a positive charge. The opposite side of the capacitor, the bottom side, is building up a positive charge. It used to have a negative charge, right? So not only does it do the charges neutralize, but they keep going past like the equilibrium situation and they keep charging up the other side. And eventually the current stops, but then you have the same situation as you had originally. It's just that now it's going to start going in the opposite direction. <laughs> so you set up what are known as LC oscillations. The current is oscillating, or, or the energy is oscillating between the, the capacitor and the inductor. An analogy that your book is drawing is that, so any sort of oscillatory motion uh, is an analog for this. So suppose you took a, uh, a box connected to a spring and you moved it away from its equilibrium situation or uh, spot. So the, the spring in its relaxed length would be that far away, but you stretch it out, say. So all the energy is in potential energy, and then you let the box go. It's, the spring is going to pull it back, and eventually it's going to get to equilibrium, but the box is moving. So it doesn't, it's not just going to stop immediately. It's going to move past the equilibrium position and start to compress the spring. Uh, so it compresses the spring a bunch until it stops, but then the spring wants to push it the, you know, to the right rather than pull it to the left. So the spring starts pushing it to the right, and again, it overshoots the equilibrium position until it stretches out. So what's going on here is that potential energy is getting converted to kinetic energy and then back to potential. And this is exactly what's going on with energy stored in the capacitor. And then it goes to sort of kinetic energy that's uh, current through the inductor. But then it goes back to potential energy stored on the, the capacitor and just keeps bouncing back and forth. So what you can do um, by a Kirchhoff loop rule here, being a little careful with uh, the equations, you can show how quickly you can you can solve for how much time it takes for one period of motion. So one period of motion is not only not all the charges going to the opposite side, but then going back to the original configuration where the top plate of the capacitor was positively charged and the bottom was negatively charged. So your book shows how to do this, um, and you get this is the angular frequency. So this is the number of radians per second that's saying how quickly the thing oscillates. Uh, and so the period, how long it takes 
uh, for one whole oscillation to get back to its original uh, situation is 2 pi divided by this omega. Um, so given, given the values of the inductance of the inductor and the capacitance of the capacitor, uh, you can solve for, for these values. This pops up a lot, by the way, in circuits. I mean, if you're an electrical, electrical engineer, um, you're going to be seeing that combination of LC a lot. Um, it, this will also uh, give you some information about like how quickly signals propagate in wires. I mean, th this will uh, this is going to come up over and over again. Um, yeah. So you can talk about the either the charge on the capacitor or the current in the uh, that's going through the inductor as a function of time. And this capital T is telling you exactly what this period is. So like the capital T that we just wrote down right here uh, is telling you how much time it takes from one peak to the, to the next peak. But they're both sinusoidal functions. So they're both sines or cosines or you know, off by some, some phase angle. OK, the last section is about LR circuits. So now we're seeing how an inductor behaves with a resistor. Uh, and maybe hooked up to a battery, because just by themselves, an L and an R are just going to get rid of the energy right away. Um, so let's see how that. Let's see what happens here. Um, so we have a switch, and let's say we close the switch. So we close the circuit. Now current can go uh, around this closed path. So the the, the battery is going to try and force current to go this direction around the uh, the circuit. The only problem here is that um, the circuit can't uh, the circuit can't have current go from zero to a non-zero value of current instantly. So the inductor is limiting how quickly the current can go up. Um, what happens when you close the switch is that the inductor acts like a break in the circuit at t equals zero. So at t equals zero. Uh, inductor, an inductor acts like a break. You break in the circuit. If there was no current beforehand, so the, uh, so if there was if there was no current going going on in the inductor right before a switch is open or closed, then there's no current going on in the inductor right after the switch is open or closed. So it acts like a break. And then at t equals infinity, then the inductor just acts like a wire acts like a wire. Because at infinite amount of time, everything is settled to its equilibrium or steady state values. So current's not going to change over time. DIDP is zero. So there's no back EMF across the inductor. If there's no back, if there's no voltage drop or gain across the inductor, then it just acts like a wire. So this is kind of opposite what a, a capacitor was like. Remember a capacitor, if it was uncharged, it acts like a wire at t equals zero, but then it acts like a break after an infinite amount of time. Whereas an inductor is almost exactly the opposite. So what happens is that the um, current. Oh, this is this is when you flip the switch again. Um, so the current, as a function of time, in when the switch is in position A. Uh, so it will rise up and then it asymptotes to uh, the voltage ac across the battery, delta V battery divided by R. So this is what we're used to, right? V equals IR across the battery. If you wait an infinite amount of time, the, the inductor just acts like a wire and it doesn't do any, there's no voltage drop or anything. So the resistance of the in the circuit tells you exactly how big the, the maximum current is in the circuit. The inductor is just telling you how quickly it can charge up right there. So this derivative, uh, this is when, so this derivative is di dt, um, and you would use this equation that the uh, back EMF across the inductor is equal in magnitude to delta V across the battery. So this is at T equals zero. This is true. Uh, and this is L di dt. So you can solve for you know, how quickly this thing can charge up or what the derivative is at T equals zero for that line. Um, it would be, you know, if that battery was 12 volts, it would be 12 volts divided by the inductance of the inductor. That tells you di dt. So this tells you like, how quickly this thing will start to uh, go up to its maximum value. But then if you wait an infinite amount of time, it doesn't matter what the value of the inductor is. 
So you wait a long time, there's current going on in the circuit, and then you flip the switch back to B. So there's current immediate, there's current going on in the inductor. And when I said that it acts like a brake initially, that's only if it originally didn't have any uh, current. So the, the inductor acts like a brake if no current, if no current right before. But if there was current, it's not going to just stop right away. Remember, it can't, because, because of this equation right here, di dt can't be infinitely big. Um, so the current in this circuit will decay down. Uh, and the decay follows uh, this formula right here. This is an exponential decay, just like we saw before with the RC circuit stuff a lot. The only difference is now that now our time constant is not r times c, but it's l over r. This is our new inductive inductive time constant. So I didn't talk about the units of inductance, but it's that's a Weber. Uh, so remember, it was flux divided by current. So Weber divided by an amp is what's called a Henry. These are the units of inductance. Uh, and actually, if you took a Henry and you divided it by an ohm, it's not obvious at all, but a Henry divided by an ohm is seconds. So SI units work out. So the L over R is the SI unit of time, seconds. Um, and this tells you roughly how long it takes to either set up current in the first place or how long it takes for the current to die out in the circuit if, if you were to short out the battery and just let the, let the uh, I guess I should say remove the battery rather than throw out the battery and just let the, the current die down on the circuit. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So let's look at this example problem with, so it looks like we have a, a battery connected to an inductor and a resistor. It looks like this is an LR circuit. LR, RL, same thing. Um, so not an L LC circuit. So we're not looking at oscillations. The switch is closed at T equals zero. Uh, so let's see here. The switch is closed. If there was no current originally going through the inductor, there can be no current right after the inductor. So I at T equals zero plus, so right after the switch was closed, is zero. Uh, the inductor prevents uh, it from immediately changing, um, discontinuously changing. Uh, what is the di dt at t equals zero? Well, okay, so if you close the switch, so let's imagine the switch is closed now. Um, if you close the switch and you look at a Kirchhoff loop rule, uh, what happens is, so I'm gonna imagine going around uh, counterclockwise. So this is my start and my end point. Um, so I'm gonna gain three volts across the battery. There's no current in the circuit, so there's no voltage gain or drop uh, when we traverse the 10 ohm resistor. So it's delta V zero across there. Therefore, we must lose three volts across the inductor. So this would be the plus side and the minus side across the inductor. This makes sense that it's in that direction because it's trying to, it's gonna act like a battery that is trying to make current in the opposite direction from the battery, right? It doesn't like the fact that it's that the current is increasing to the left across the inductor. So it's going to try and make current to the right. Um, and at t equals zero, uh, at t equals zero plus, the voltage across the inductor has magnitude three volts. It's the same as the voltage across the battery. So we see this from a Kirchhoff loop rule. We gain three volts across the battery. We have to lose the three volts across the inductor, going from the right side of the inductor to the left side of the inductor. So we're going to. So this is the back EMF. Uh, we're going to set this equal to L di dt. Uh, so three, so SI units, it, three is equal to the inductance of the inductor is 20 millihenries di dt. Uh, so three divided by 20, uh, that's like 15 divided by 100. Uh, and then milli on the bottom so, so you see what I did, I divided both sides by 20. So it's three over 20. And I multiplied by five on the top and the bottom. And then milli is still on the bottom. So this is times 10 to the three uh, amps per second would be the IDT. 
Uh, and then, so a thousand divided by a hundred looks like it's 150. So 150 amps per second. That's how quickly it initially jumps up. Okay, this isn't DIDT for later times because, right? If you, so if we if we plotted the current as a function of time, remember it is going to look like this, but then it's going to start to asymptote. So what we just found was the derivative right at t equals zero, but really it's going to slow down. It's not going to creep up as quickly. As you can guess, like the form of this is going to be i is equal to i max times one minus e to the minus t over tau. Right. Uh, very similar to when a capacitor was was charging up. Um, okay, and then what is the current at t equals two milliseconds? Okay, so let's let's find what the um, time constant is, the inductive time constant of the circuit. Remember it was L over R. Uh, our inductor is twenty, has inductance twenty millihenries, and our resistor is ten ohms. It looks like this is 2.0 milliseconds is our inductive time constant. And we're actually, this is kind of co a coincidence, what's the current at two milliseconds? So at exactly one time constant. Uh, so the equation that we would use is I at T is uh, I max uh, times E to the minus T over tau. So really we would compute, I mean, we just computed tau uh, and we had the time that was a separate thing. So we, we would plug those two things in separately, but they happen to be the same value. So we're going to go ahead and plug in I max times E to the minus. So this is two milliseconds divided by two milliseconds. So E to the minus one is about uh, point, uh, 0.37. So this is about 37%, 63%, sorry. <laughs> 63% of I max. No, just sorry. <laughs> um, this is the formula that we need to be using, right? The current is one minus that. This is why I'm getting confused. So this is I max times, sorry, one minus this, right? Because it needs to satisfy that at infinite time, there is a current. Uh, this makes more sense. So this is 0.37 and then one minus that is 0.63. Uh, so the current is 0 0.63 times its maximum value. And its maximum value is we can figure out by just replacing the inductor with a wire and uh, using Ohm's law. So then we would have the full three volts across the resistor. Three volts equals 10 ohms times the current, V equals IR. So it looks like the current is three tenths of an amp. Well, I max is uh, three tenths of an amp, 0 0.30 amps. So it looks like 63% of that is, uh, I don't know, somewhere around uh, 0 0.2, zero amps, maybe 0 0.19, between 0 0.19 and 0 0.20 amps. So current at two milliseconds T equals tau L, it's equal to this, right? All right, a lot of a lot of stuff to finish up chapter 3.